Uh, thank you. Um, only appropriate that we uh, honor and uh, pay tribute to, to Bruce this evening. Uh, he was not only going to moderate this important discussion, but he was excited about it uh, because Bruce was somebody who cared deeply, not just for his profession, but for the community that he represented for so many years. He knew that uh, the point of the story was not the headline, but the details, and he always pushed for the details. How do we solve problems? But what so many of us will remember him for, including myself, is that personal touch. Whenever I saw him the Saturday uh, before he passed, I'd talk to him in front of his house, and he would always ask, how's your dad? You know, that, that's who Bruce was. He cared about people, um, and he wanted to make uh, our city, our region better. And uh, certainly tonight is not the same without him. Uh, but in his memory, we challenge ourselves to make sure that we are pushing ourselves to find solutions and have the difficult conversations. I remember Bruce Johnson when I worked with council member in DC, uh, council member Kevin Chavis. <coughs> Bruce learned about my story as a returning citizen and, and when I became a council member a couple of years ago in Prince George's County, uh, Judge Williams, Bruce would always call and just say, Calvin, what's going on? Are you really divorced for returning citizens? Do you have the courage to stand up with your colleagues and make re-entry and returning citizens a part of the discussion as we deal with the crime issues in our region. And every now and again, Robert and Will, Bruce would just call and say, how's the journey going? Are you still standing up and being the voice and to ensure that returning citizens <coughs> are part of the conversation of how we address the violence and crime issues in our region? And I will never forget that about Bruce Johnson. Thank you, gentlemen. Well said. Yes. Um, we are going to, I'm going to just frame the conversation briefly and then turn to our great, great panel. Uh, uh, since Bruce isn't here, I'm going to do worse than he did and try to moderate. We're going to, it takes three of us to split up his job. So mm -hmm. Council Member Hawkins and White and I will split up the moderating duties tonight. Um, so we're here tonight to have a regional conversation about the challenges in our community uh, of public and community safety. Um, everyone deserves to feel and to be safe. We start from that premise. Uh, we know that these last two plus years have been traumatic in many ways for our community. Um, and we know prior to that, uh, that the root causes of disinvestment, lack of opportunity, uh, have led to higher crime in some communities, particularly our low income communities. And so we're here tonight to talk about real detailed, both policy and, you know, really practical solutions with a very, very smart panel. You know, you have, and I, when I introduce them in a second, you'll see, uh, to, to really move this conversation forward. I remember when I called Council Member White and said, you know, we should pull, do this conversation, I was up in Olney, and if those of you are from Montgomery County, welcome to Montgomery County, and there was a gentleman on the corner, this is our far northeastern part of our county, who was panhandling and asking for money on the corner, middle-aged African-American gentleman. I pulled over like I always do, and I said, hey, are you, where are you staying tonight? Are you doing okay? I tried to see if he had needed services. He said, well, I live in D.C. He said, um, I'm staying at a shelter down there, and I'm trying to find a job, but I come, I, I come up here because there's more, I can have this space to myself. And I said, well, how did you get here? He said, I took the bus. Um, and I, call, I pulled over, I called Robert, and I said, we've got to have a regional conversation. He wasn't doing anything wrong, but it's an example of how interconnected our issues are. You know, I I've, I've grew up in Montgomery County, but I lived in Prince George's County. I lived in D.C. I went to law school in D.C. We work, live, play. All of our issues are interconnected, so we're only going to solve those problems and challenges and take advantage of opportunities if we're working together. And we need to have it in a holistic approach. Um, law enforcement are part of the solution. They are not the solution. And you're going to hear about that tonight. Um, so uh, I appreciate everyone coming out uh, and those who are joining us online. Uh, this will be available online as well. 
so let me quickly introduce our and get into the discussion. We will have a portion for Q&A from the audience. There should be some cards. We'll be collecting them. Uh, I want to recognize our colleague, Denny Tavares, Prince George's County Council Member, who's here. Um, and I also see, uh, is, uh, where we go, who is that? Oh, there you go, Mel, uh, our, 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 our wonderful, uh, also at-large Prince George's uh, County Council Member. Good to see you, sir. Um, give him a round of applause. Um, and, it, and I'm gonna leave the rest to them if they see other people, okay? <laughs> Uh, so the first, to my left, uh, the Honorable Alexander Williams. He's a retired uh, U.S. District Court Judge for the District of Maryland. I was actually a uh, former state's attorney in Prince George's County, elected the same year Ike Leggett was elected uh, to, to the County Council in 1986. <laughs> um, and uh, he's a graduate of Howard University undergrad and then law school at Howard University uh, in 1973. He served as a professor there, state's attorney for Prince George's County. Uh, and in 1993, uh, he was nominated by President Clinton for the vacancy in the United States District Court Judge for the District of Maryland. Uh, he's the founder, member, uh, a founding member and the first president of the J. Franklin Bourne uh, Association, which is an association I'm a member of, a lot of black attorneys in this region, as well as a member of the National Prince George's County Bar. So let's give him a round of applause. Uh, Sonia Pruitt, skipping over one because it's in my notes, uh, is a good friend of mine for 20 plus years, but a retired uh, Montgomery County Police Department captain, uh, the first and only African American woman to ever achieve that rank in 100 years mm. in Montgomery County wow. Police Department. She's also past chair of the National Black Police Association. She holds a BS in criminal justice and MA in forensic psychology. She is an associate professor of criminal justice at the Rockville campus of Montgomery College, so welcome home. In her spare time, she oversees a clearinghouse of law enforcement information and education called the Black Police Experience and is on the board of directors of the Law Enforcement Action Partnership, which works towards criminal justice and police reform. Uh, she, she also sits on the program's committee on the National Law Enforcement Museum. So thank you, Sonia, for joining us. We appreciate it. <laughs> or Captain, Pru Captain Pruitt, excuse me. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Keisha Middlemass, who is to her right, is an associate professor in the Department of Political Science at Howard University who teaches graduate and undergraduate courses in public policy and American politics. And she studies the intersection of race, public policy, and, and marginalized populations. Her award-winning book, Convicted and Condemned, The Politics and Policies of Prisoner Reentry, which was published in 2017, is an interdisciplinary and multi-layered examination of prisoner reentry. Dr. Middlemass is a member of the Racial Democracy, Crime, and Justice Network, a former Andrew Mellon postdoctoral fellow on race, crime, and justice at the Vera Institute of Justice, and a former American Political Science Association Congressional Fellow, and currently a Brookings Fellow. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Ronald Moton, or Ron Moton as we call him, uh, a fifth generation Washingtonian, uh, who went to Roosevelt Senior High School. Uh, he's a renowned peace activist, political advisor, and go-go promoter, um, and known <laughs> as a passionate advocate for his native Washington, D.C. He's also a co-founder of Don't Mute D.C., fighting against gentrification. Ronald Moton. <laughs> and last but not least, Eric Weaver is, who's to my left, is the founder and chairman of the National Association for the Advancement of returning citizens and the deputy director of the Ready Sit Center under the DC Department of Corrections. Eric is a returning citizen who went to jail at the age of 17 and came home three months before his 40th birthday. And he's, he's still, I don't know, he don't look 40 now, so. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, but let's give Eric a round of applause. <laughs> All right, let's jump into it. I wanna thank <coughs> each of our panelists for joining us. So the way we're gonna do this, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna start with Eric and just work our way down. Uh, is that okay? Sure. And we're gonna give two to three minutes just to frame based on the conversation we're having, their, their uh, thoughts on this, and then we'll get into some questions. Eric? Uh, good evening, everyone. Again, Eric Weaver, um, as uh, they said in the, the short bio about me, I once was uh, a part of the problem now. I'm just happy to be a part of the solution. I feel like I've been a, a, 
a perpetrator of, of violence. I've been the victim of violence. I even uh, lost my son three years ago to, uh, to violence. So um, I got a whole lot of um, skin in this game, if, if you would say. Um, and I think it's important for us to have this conversation definitely from the lens of these connecting um, regions or, or, or cities, um, jurisdictions, because what I know about uh, mainly in D.C., when a lot of us were coming up in D.C. as our family members started, I guess, having more success in their life, they kind of moved away from D.C. and they moved into PG County and Montgomery County as a sign of success, being able to move out of the projects and move to these areas. During that time, we were incarcerated. And so when we came home, even though we were born, raised, and did all our stuff in D.C., we now live in, 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 in PG County and Montgomery County. So I think it only makes sense for us now to have this conversation where we connect in the dots with, with our neighbors and also trying to duplicate some of the services that may be working in other parts. So, um, you know, I'm just happy to be a part of the conversation and thank you all for coming to here. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> Judge? Yes, uh, thank you all so much for having me. I want to certainly express my appreciation to these three uh, very powerful Congress persons, uh, I mean, council persons. You got a promotion. <laughs> yeah, got a promotion, <laughs> council persons. But uh, I am a native of Washington, D.C. I spent a lot of time in Prince George's after I finished uh, Howard. And of course, I practiced law a lot in Montgomery. So the violence that you see uh, throughout uh, these three areas is tough and it's very complex. And I would just uh, simply say, I'm glad we're having these discussions. We need some policies that's going to address, first of all, getting rid of the underlying root causes uh, that breed crime. We got to deal with that poverty and lack of education, lack of opportunities, the anger. We got to deal with that. But I'm also concerned about the media. Uh, the mass media that portrays uh, a lot of uh, bad. And when people see uh, bad on the media, they uh, tend to repeat that and uh, operate in a way that they're portrayed. When we see the ugliness uh, last week uh, on uh, Justice Jackson and the questions they were posing to her, when young people see that, then they say, well, if they treat those people that way, how are they gonna treat us? So I would like to see the media uh, change. And, and uh, the last thing I'd say, because we only have a, a couple of minutes to say, is that I would just like to see some way that we can reach our youth and to uh, give them uh, more tutoring, more counseling on values and, and, and uh, how to grow, how to be responsible, how to respect uh, individuals and so forth. And when we get to that point, uh, I think we're beginning to turn the corner. But right now, uh, we're not doing a good job of reaching our young people. They see a lot of violence uh, in their neighborhood and, uh, and they act out. And so uh, let's uh, try to uh, push together and see what we can do to reach our young people and give them a more positive spin. Uh, the last thing I want to say is this. Uh, I've been in uh, restorative justice and reforming criminal justice for years. I've done that as a young lawyer when I was practicing. I've been a professor at the law school, I've uh, been a public defender. And since I left the bench, I've been doing a lot of reentry and all kinds of things. But I want to say you got to balance all of that with, I call it accountability. We've got to make sure that our young people are accountable and, and, and they can't run around the school system uh, disrespecting principals, disrespecting teachers, doing all kind of crazy stuff in the schools. They got to be accountable. And we just can't sit back as policy makers and say, oh, we can't suspend them, uh, our, our stats are gonna go up. No, young people have to be made accountable. And that's what uh, I'm gonna be pushing back here today. <laughs> Thank you, Judge. Uh, Dr. Middlemass. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you th tonight. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, so I am a trained political scientist, but study reentry. So for an academic, that is strange. Normally, it's sociologists or criminologists who actually tackle all the systems that are connected to police. So policing all the way to prisoner reentry and everything in between and started challenging criminologists and how they think about crime, but how they think about the people who are then sentenced because of their criminal behavior. 
and in challenging the sort of traditional notions of how we study crime, you get these large end studies, but you rarely speak to people who actually have experienced the systems. And so I always start with the individual and go up to the systems versus starting with the systems and the large N, we've got one point X number of people incarcerated. I'm like, yeah, but those are one million families that are also incarcerated. That's one million neighborhoods that are also affected. And so I'm thinking holistically all the way, but start holistically, but starting with the individual. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. <laughs> Captain Pruitt. I, I, I was looking to hear some more, but I guess <laughs> <laughs> you have more time. What, what do you? What, do, what would you? What is your question? I, 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 I'm gonna have some. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to come back to you, doctor. Um, thank you for the invitation. Actually, Dr. Uh, Milnes <coughs> and I were speaking um, in the green room about some of these things that we're talking about now in our introductory remarks. And one of my passions, which is history, um, the black police experience, what we do is partner with anthropologists, sociologists, criminologists, and now Dr. Middlemass to address these issues from the racial, the intersection of race and policing. Um, and then trying to identify solutions and speak on them and, and actually ha have, and have the people understand what those solutions look like um, and why they might be good solutions. And then we all move forward as one to try and address the issues. But, um, so that's about my work. But tonight, I would like to speak a little bit about crime and the police. I want people to understand that crime is not driven by the number of police officers that you hire. I'm gonna say it again, crime is not driven by the number of police officers that you hire. If you have a sufficient police force, that means that they are available to do lots of things like uh, run calls for service, uh, but really, police should also be working in concert with the community. It, what drives crime rates down is also um, a function of how your police have become a trusted part of your community. So it's based on trust, trust builds legitimacy, and that's what drives the crime rate down, not because you went out and you spent money on hiring more police officers. And then for a quick segue into defunding, you know, I hate that that, that word has <coughs> been, um, appropriated and then propagandized because police departments have been defunded since time untold. Anytime Montgomery County says, we don't have the money in the budget for you to do this thing with the police department this year, but maybe next year, that's defunding. So be clear about what you're asking for when you talk about defunding. If you're asking to transfer money from one place to another, that's one thing. But don't get caught up in that, that politicized phrasing about defunding the police. Sometimes the police department is just not going to get as much money, and sometimes money is going to go somewhere else. And so as a community, I would ask that you be very engaged and, and seek to learn. My last comment is about uh, yesterday I hosted a webinar about unintended consequences, because policy and law are important in this conversation that we're having, right? And you need to understand why the policy and the law were created. We were talking about voting rights. We were talking about marijuana laws, the, dis the disparity between cocaine and powder cocaine and crack cocaine sentencing, menthol bans. How does that affect our, commun our vulnerable communities? Laws that the police follow, like pretextual stops. How does that affect our community, right? And parole and probation. Parole and probation is not as simple as you get out on parole and probation. There are some costs to that as someone who has been incarcerated and when they get out, not have enough money to even pay their fines and end up back into the system in prison. So these are all really important things and I, I hope that you ask some questions that I'm able to answer. Mm -hmm. But as you can see, I'm really community driven. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Moten. Yes, it's a pleasure of, uh, being here. Once again, I wanna thank you all for having me here. Um, I, I want to say this. I came home from prison 25 years ago. And before then, I had been in and out five times and didn't care, you know, pay money in D.C. back then. You get right back out. You get a good lawyer, Kenneth Money, Robert Mance. You ain't do no time before the feds came. But 
When I came home the fifth time, it was an organization in the community called Cease Fire Don't Smoke the Brothers and Sisters, and they showed me how to take the talent that I had and use it the right way. And they gave me love. And a lot of people don't understand, that's what most young people want. They want to be held accountable too, but you can't hold nobody accountable if you don't love them first. So, you know, I don't, I don't believe, like when I was with Cease Fire, I remember walking into a parking lot at McDonald's and a young man with an AK-47 with me and Al Malik in the parking lot. And they weren't scared and we weren't scared because we knew that we had a relationship with them and they knew who we were and they knew we cared about them. So I think part of the problem with the work and what's going on, we're scared of the young people because we know we haven't loved them. When you love people, it's like you're kind of crazy because you you're not scared of them. And the problem is a lot of people have this super, superficial love. You know, they love when it's beneficial to them, right? But it's not an unconditional love. With people who have been broken down, traumatized, and have been through so much, right? Just like my ancestors for 400 years in this country have been through so much. And nobody never wants to talk about it, right? But this has been passed down from generation to generation. Even our relationship with the police has been passed down. Not that there hasn't been good relationships with the officer friendly program that they got rid of, that we know work, because we had relationships where we weren't scared of the police coming up, even if we were doing wrong, because we knew the police from a child. They used to pick us up, take us to the boys club. They knew our parents, they knew who we were. And we've had, I will close with this. The bad thing about this is crime is going up. The good thing is some of us in here have been a part of the work in the community where we saw crime go down for years. The problem with the system is nobody cares unless there is a problem. Mm. So when things start working, right, we stop funding them. We stop building people up so nothing's institutionalized to last. Mm. And we got to stop that because we're just responsive to problems. We don't do things to deal like some of the people before me said, deal with the, 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 the problems that cause these problems. And, and we, our children, in a lot of cases, need surrogate parents. You're talking about, I heard uh, the sisters in there talking about case management. We had one of the most successful programs in the country at Peace of Harlots. But we fought, we fought the system to allow us to have a 25 to 1 ratio for our most violent offenders. And we were very successful. So our case managers were like surrogate parents to these young people who often lived in chaos in their households. And that's why I was successful. So, you know, some of the things that work are expensive and nobody wants to do those things, but we end up spending more money <laughs> anyway when we had to deal with the problem. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Thank you. I'm going to get ready to invite uh, my colleagues up for the next part of the discussion, but you, I just wanted to <coughs> recap uh, one thing that you said. Uh, all of you had a through line of making these investments. Love, uh, understanding the system that we're in, helping people when they re-enter. Um, and, you know, I, I had a meeting last night and we were talking about one of the things that's up in Montgomery County and across the region is carjackings, right? It's a very specific thing. And we know that young people are disproportionately involved in these. Now, all young people, I'm the father of four and of everyone in this room, when you're a young person, you, do, you make stupid decisions, right? But when you do it in the context of hopelessness, no love, no opportunity, no job program, no after school program, you make dangerous, stupid decisions. And I think that is something that we have to come to terms with. Doesn't make it right, doesn't mean there shouldn't be accountability and that shouldn't happen to anybody. But we have to get back, back pedal and get to those root cause solutions. Otherwise, we're just putting Band-Aids on things. Um, and so I wanna bring up, uh, Council Member White for our next part of our conversation to frame what he sees in, in Washington and then move to the next part of the conversation with our panelists. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm uh, glad to start to move into uh, more of the discussion portion with, with our panelists and start to have an, an important conversation. <coughs> I just want to uh, start by, by framing this a bit. Um, we're going to be talking in this section about uh, responding to crime and preventing crime. It, what I think we all know, regardless of the perspectives that we come with on public safety and how we become more safe, what we all know is that we all want to feel safe uh, in our communities, in our region, and we all deserve to feel safe 
And we all also want to see our neighbors thrive. We don't want to see people incarcerated. Uh, the question for us is sort of how we meet both of, of these needs. And for me, I believe the most important thing we do as, as leaders, whether it's elected officials, uh, civic leaders, or what have you, is, is listen to people, listen to communities. We hear a lot of people, uh, particularly as we have seen a spike in, uh, in homicides, a spike in violent crime, we hear people saying, we need more police, we need more police. And those people want to feel safe. That's what they're asking for. They're asking to feel safe. But we hear other folks saying, <coughs> we want to see fewer police and more of those resources going into other things. And those folks are also saying, we want to feel safe. Our first job is to listen, to understand sort of what are these folks expressing, not to kind of get into our trenches and say we know the way to get there, but to listen and work as a community to say how do we really make our city and our region safe. I'll share a little bit about my personal experience uh, only because it is an experience that's familiar to many people who grew up in D.C. and the area. Like too many other young people growing up in this area, I saw my first drive-by shooting at nine years old when I was at Upshur playground. I've lost family uh, members to gun violence in the District of Columbia. Uh, very recently, someone pulled out a gun in front of my daughter's daycare uh, at, on Kennedy Street. It was not the first time, um, and it's a, it's a part of the city where we've seen a lot of shootings. Uh, but I've also had family members, including my brother, go through our criminal justice system. I know <coughs> what it feels like as a family member to see someone in your family incarcerated, to see the difficulties of incarceration, the separation from family and communities, and then the difficult road home. Folks who are incarcerated, who spend years, sometimes decades, dreaming about what they are going to do when they return home, how they're going to stabilize their lives, how they're going to support their families, how they're going to build their careers and be productive members of their community, but when they return, are often faced with so many obstacles that make that dream too, too far out of reach. Now we know a couple other things. I think most of us, not everybody, but most of us agree that police are an important part of our public safety response. But police alone don't make a public safety system. We know, first of all, that there are things that sort of breed uh, our public safety crisis, the disparities in education, housing uh, instability, trauma inside our communities, a broken safety net for people uh, facing uh, addiction and, and other challenges, and the fundamental lack of interventions before people commit crime. And so I'm of the belief that while there, there must be a strong police department to respond to crime, that by time, you know, those red and blue lights come and that yellow tape goes up, we, we have failed at that point. We have to do so much more to prevent crime in the first place. We need to make sure we have a police department that can respond, that can make sure that we are safe. But then we also have to recognize that there are communities that have been plagued with terrible violence for decades. And that that violence has impact not just on the people who have lost their lives or the family members uh, who, who have lost other family members, but on the young people who have seen that. We have to know that there is trauma in the young people in our communities that goes unaddressed and then later in life presents itself in unhealthy ways. The challenge in front of us now is how we pull these elements together to, to say how do we address, <coughs> how do we prevent crime, and how do we appropriately respond to crime, and that is no difficult challenge. The uh, Black Lives Matter movement uh, was a movement that I believe was inevitable, and it was an important time for people to voice concerns that had built up over decades. But now is the time that we have to start to have productive conversations to say, OK, what is the next step? What might police or uh, criminal justice reform look like in a way that makes us safe, not just now, but 10 years from now? So I want to engage our experts in, in some questions about really what we do now, how we move forward uh, in, in the best way. And so I, I want to start with uh, Dr. Middlemass. Um, the, the District of, of Columbia is on track to have our sixth consecutive year uh, of increasing homicides, and the pandemic has certainly uh, put real pressure on everyone from school children to parents to our local workforce, uh, which on some level has strained people's mental health to a degree uh, that I think is, is abnormal. 
So, Dr. Middlemass, what, what are the gaps that you think we should be focusing on as we respond to the current increases in violent crime? Big question. So, we have to think about the issue of violence because we know from data it takes place generally in um, concentrated communities and then only in a few areas of those concentrated communities. Um, and police respond to crime. If New York City this week on the shooting of the subway showed us six billion dollar budget and NYPD could not prevent mass casualties and death on a public on public transportation. So this idea of moving funds, not defunding, but moving funds, I think is the heart of actually addressing violent crime to that holistic approach. Um, <coughs> the challenge, however, is the most immediate response, the reaction to violent crime is more police. But we also know that more police does not actually prevent crime. Police respond to and investigate crime, but they don't necessarily prevent all crimes, particularly violent crime. Violent crime is around power, it's around um, control, it's usually based on emotion, um, and it's usually an age group. And so the idea is to address the underlying issues in the community by transferring money Police, I don't, I don't know much about police budgets, but I do know that social service programs are underfunded. So what about funding after school programs? What about funding social work workers to respond to mental health crises? This is not new or illuminating. This is just sort of common sense. The challenge <coughs> is can these ideas outlive the budget process in the political environment? Can it outlive the election cycle? Because elected officials need platforms with which to run on, which means they have to immediately respond, which is not a bad thing, but when we're actually going to address violent crime, there's all these other things that need to actually be addressed and have a long-term investment that will then outlive the budget cycle, the next election, but more importantly, have the political will. And I just want to congratulate these three council members for actually putting this on because this is showing that they will be in the public to take public positions to then be able to move policies forward. I know that does not directly answer your question, <coughs> but it gets to this idea that we can't address violent crime with just one thing. It's not going to be just police. It's gonna be a whole bunch of different things. Uh, thank you. So this actually leads perfectly into my next question, which uh, Captain Pruitt actually s sort of teed up in, in your own introduction. So we, we know that police are not equipped to handle every emergency and, and shouldn't be expected to do so. So how do we decenter police from responding to uh, certain <coughs> issues, public safety or, or otherwise, that they that may not, uh, so that they can respond to more violent crimes? Where, where, do, where should we be looking to decenter police from sort of some of the things that police departments traditionally do now? Yeah, that's a great question, and I think that it also depends on the jurisdiction. The, there are different needs depending on where you <coughs> are. Um, although Montgomery County, uh, Prince George's County, and Washington, D.C. overlap, they have different needs in different areas. So you start there, like what are our needs? And uh, in, in no way, shape, or form will I ever support anything but community involvement in those conversations. One of the things I was really disappointed in um, about the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act was that a lot of decisions were made politically without the input of the community, of those people whose lives that that, uh, that bill would affect. Um, they didn't even ask black police officers what we thought, well maybe one group. But <laughs> there was really no input from all of the major stakeholders. And so um, that conversation is going to have to involve the people, and you know, because that's who the police serve, right? You have to ask the police for what it is that you want. And speaking of that, I, you know, there's obviously a disconnect between the police and the community. After the death of George Floyd um, and the Black Lives Matter movement and the, and the uh, uprisings and the protests, 
a lot of police officers, not just black police officers, they knelt and they raised their fist in the air and they said, we're here for this. We know we have solidarity. We understand what you're feeling. And about two weeks later, the union, the police unions were saying, get up off your knees and come back to work. And some of you, depending on where you live, we're not gonna represent you as a union member unless you get up off your knees. And so there's a disconnect about the needs of a community and where the police stand. You know, there's it's always been this disconnect. The police departments were created on this disconnect, right? That we are the powerful ones and you have to do what we tell you to do. So, again, the community is gonna have to be very, very um, persistent in what your needs are, <coughs> telling your, your local police departments what those needs are, and then being engaged in the process. Don't just say, listen to what you're being told, but be involved in that conversation and having it move forward. Appreciate that. Yeah. Um, uh, Judge Williams, I, I have a, a, a tough question for, for you as well. Uh, often when there are, are calls for more police, there are also calls for harsher prosecutions. There's a, a notion that if the sentences are, are more harsh, uh, then, then people will, will act uh, better. I, I am uh, of the people who don't, don't believe that. I, but, you know, sort of where this gets mischaracterized is often if, if, if you make the claim, as I do, that harsher sentences don't necessarily deter crime, some folks will interpret that as not, not wanting accountability, uh, which I think is, is not the same thing, but more interested in sort of your view how do we hold perpetrators of crime accountable while shifting away from, from harsh punishments, assuming you believe we should shift away? Yeah, I, I agree with you, uh, and uh, I want uh, everyone here to uh, certainly uh, understand that we all are concerned about the disparities in criminal justice. There are too many, uh, particularly African-Americans, being incarcerated. The sentences are too long. There's discretion that's exercised by police officers and prosecutors that are not fair. We, we understand that, I understand that. I've been fighting uh, to deal with that uh, you know, for years. <coughs> but by the same token, as I said, there has to be a balance. And, uh, and you have to allow uh, prosecutors and uh, officers to at least do their job and, uh, and make sure that they uh, have the tools and the resources that's necessary to, uh, to address uh, the, the violence. Uh, and again, I come back to, uh, uh, Councilman Wright, I come back to the public school system. Again, 68 years since the Brown case, when the Supreme Court said, uh, desegregate with all deliberate speed, 68 years later, and most of the school systems in this country are uh, still segregated. And, uh, and I tell you, we would really learn a lot if we had teachers uh, uh, on this panel and they can tell you what's happening into the schools right now and all the violence. So my, my point is that uh, you've got to uh, uh, certainly address criminal justice reform, but you have to be balanced and make sure that people are held accountable for what they do. Uh, uh, getting hold of guns right now uh, and these ghost guns and this kind of thing uh, is not right. And, and I just talked to two judges three days ago and they told me that when uh, the young people who are in school, when they come before them, 17, 18, with a weapon, they're not gonna get any bond, period. And, and, and that's part of the uh, accountability. So it's a balance. I don't know all the answers, but you've got to certainly uh, hold people uh, uh, accountable for what they do. <clears throat> in, I'm sorry, Councilman, Council Member White. If, if the United States were going to use long prison sentences to address all the social issues, we would have no crime in this country. Like the United States is really good with long prison sentences. They have not deterred this they have not deterred people from going out and committing crimes. Mm. And so I just want, like, holding people accountable, all for it. But when we start thinking about five, eight, 10, 20, 30 years, where we gotta, as the judge said, we gotta find some balance because putting people into cages and letting them out because 95, 96, 97% of people who are incarcerated return home, which means that we're incarcerating lots of people, but lots of people are coming home too. 
and the funding is all on the front end. It's on the policing, it's prosecution, it's in the prison system. So if you think on average, a state spends about a billion dollars on its state prison system, on average, California, New York, New Jersey, higher, Florida, higher, Texas, out <laughs> the box because they execute someone every two weeks, it seems. Um, that's, I'm being facetious, I forgot we were online. Um, sometimes people don't understand I make, I make jokes so I don't cry. But this point is we, we spend, as a society, as taxpayers, as voters, we spend more on the front end and re-entry gets a drop in the bucket. So for every billion dollars we're spending just on the criminal, or sorry, just on the state prison system, we are spending about $100,000 on re-entry. Like it is that puny on the re-entry and yet thousands of people, 12,000 people will come home this week. Just to put it in, into perspective, it's approximately 650 to 750,000 people per year. It increased a little bit because of COVID, but then you had a whole bunch of prison wardens been like, no, 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 we can't decarcerate. These are violent criminals. What I want to also, and I'm sorry, I'm going to get off my soapbox, I promise. We have like four categories of crime in this country, violent, property, drugs, and sex. Uh, so many criminals are tagged as being violent criminals, which then disallows them from getting the programming that would help them when they're inside and when they come home. Thank you for my soapbox. Um, so I, I appreciate the perspective, and it, it reminds me when you talk about the lack of resources on the back and when people re return home, it is harder to get a job, it is harder uh, to get housing, and, and so we really set ourselves up for, in, in many ways, uh, not just for more crime, but for more social services, and, and we, we make it harder for people to be productive members. And in fact, even though I'm a member of the government, I often get calls from people returning home from incarceration, and I call Eric Weaver, uh, who does this himself, and say, can you help this person? It should be the other way around. Uh, but I'm reaching out to, to folks like Eric Weaver, uh, Ron Moten, and, and others who do this work and, and sort of fill in the gaps that the government is, is not filling in. Um, so uh, let me m move to you, uh, Mr. Weaver. What, what alternatives to incarceration should we be considering? And, and what, what's the appropriate role for diversion and, and restorative justice programs? And how does that fit into accountability? Uh. So um, as uh, Dave was just saying, I definitely think that, as she said, that a lot of the stuff has always been on, on the front end and not enough on the back end. I think um, when we talk about people that want are uh, incarcerated, like what are we doing for them while they're in, we know that they're coming out. And so how do we want them to come out? I mean, if we're not doing nothing for them while they're in, then we're expecting the same person to come out a little older, but you know, still with more challenges. And, uh, uh, more responsibilities as well now because you might have went in like me at 17 and coming home now at 40 where now you're, it's expected of you to be this certain kind of way to be this productive citizen but you got the mentality or the uh, maturity or the experience of a 17 year old because you was gone your whole life so um, definitely just looking at that and figuring out what we do on the front end um, uh, also um, with this conversation, if I'm just looking at what everybody said, it's probably the first time <coughs> when we talk about violence that we really didn't return the citizens what in the, the front end of the conversation because before it's always been the people that came home are the ones who are committing the crimes that are going on out there. And now we're saying young people, everybody up here talked about accountability for the young people. So now we got to look at what we do with our young people. Most of the time when we start trying to reach out to them, when they 14, 15, 16, now we're saying that's too late. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's too late. So now we got to look at going a little younger. We got to go to the elementary schools now. We got to get the teachers. We got to get the parents. We got to get everybody involved now with the, um, with the community and, and the village, as we said. So we got to start a little younger. Even when we talk about uh, police and, and the community, I remember back in the day, the police were a part of the community because they went to school with your mother. They were your uncle. They were, so it was more so, Lord, get in the house before I tell your mother. 
and we, we don't have that no more. So you don't hear kids, when, when I was young, I had classmates that said they wanted to be a police when they grew up. We don't have that no more because of the image that's been created and you know, some, some bad answers. So I think we just gotta change that whole narrative. We definitely gotta start early um, and, and really looking at dealing with our younger, our babies. We, got, we really gotta deal with our babies. And, and in terms of um, alternatives, we really gotta look at the why. We focus so much on the what. We, we know somebody did this, but why did they do it? What the household like, you know, uh, whatever they experienced. You just said you uh, experienced your first um, seeing the job at nine years old. Did anybody address that? Like, what's right. the trauma? How are we addressing it? Like, what they expect if, if there's someone in the school that got killed and the next day they expect all the classmates to come back to school to just be normal? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the, the person I usually reach out to when, uh, first when, when I'm trying to figure out what we're missing with sort of reaching and responding to, to young people is, is Ron Moten. Um, Mr. Moten, how, how do we better respond to the needs of our youth and, and prevent them from getting engaged in, in violent crime? I think there's several things. <clears throat> One thing, think, let's think about it when we grew up. You look at Washington, D.C., we have all these pretty buildings. Montgomery County, all these pretty schools and buildings. PG County, pretty schools and buildings. We came up, we had the fashion club. We had the modeling team. We had the student government. We had all these, and not just sports, we had so many programs in these schools that were ran down. But we got these beautiful buildings that our children have no access to because we're scared of them. We're scared that something's going to happen. Teachers are not being supported the way they should, so they're running out the building at 3 o'clock instead of staying there with the students. So that's one thing. Our young people don't have the platforms that we had to get positive attention. So what they do is they use social media and other things to get attention. And normally with no supervision or nobody showing the things that we were shown, they're doing negative things to get attention. Some of them carjacking to get attention. They record carjacking sometimes. You might call them violent, but to them, it's the, you know, it's a syndrome. Wanna be syndrome to what's cool. When we came up in DC, I remember watching Scarface. I remember every morning people who grew up with me watched Scarface. Our young people have much more stuff that they have access to than we do, right? So why aren't we utilizing the internet in a way that's uplifting our community, right? We just had an event the other day at the Kennedy Center where we kicked off the social media caucus with the uh, Murrenberry Youth Institute and Don't Mute DC. And what we're doing is we're gonna give young people the platform to create positive intent content and get incentivized for it. Young people can make movies, they can, they can do Instagram, we had TikTok working with us about doing campaigns, they were out here turning your bathrooms up. Why not create campaigns where they get incentivized for creating something positive? So some of this stuff is not as hard as, as, as we think. And then when you go to policy, Rob, br Brother White, they taking young people and just throw them up on the wall and what they're doing wrong, but we took all these young people out of public housing and just threw them in different neighborhoods mm -hmm. without any support, yeah. right? Not knowing who yeah. they beefing with. We shut down community schools and then send people running around everywhere. And the same thing that happened in Chicago happened in DC. And we don't, we don't talk about these things. So some of the things, if we just fix the mess that we create, created, just like marijuana. I wasn't against legalizing marijuana, but I challenge the people before you legalize it, make sure you put an education component in it for young people, right? Because guess what? Young people can't get in programs if they have a dirty yarn. Mm -hmm. Returning mm -hmm. citizens can't get a job if they have a dirty yarn, right? But no, they rushed it. No black people got any dispensaries, so we couldn't sell drugs illegally, and we couldn't <laughs> sell drugs legally, right? So that's one thing. Then we talk about health, now everybody's lacing the marijuana with tobacco. So all the things we did to move forward with getting people from tobacco, maybe the marijuana, they smoking both of them together. So I'm just saying like, some of the stuff we can fix with good policy and having people at the table, like she said, from the community. And lastly, I would say, if we're gonna solve the problems, we have to build people up in the communities to solve their problems. 
We can't keep on having people coming down like off a UFO, yeah. like they landing in your community <laughs> and gonna fix the stuff for you while you sitting there, you sitting there, every night when the bullets go off, they somewhere and they come from home like me where I don't hear no bullets and I'm acting like I'm gonna be the spokesperson for them. Mm. No, they need to be empowered to do for self like Robert White did for us, where I took gang members and they own property on Martin Luther King Avenue, right? Not, not on your flyer, like your little, your little child that you going around getting money for. No, equity. These people want equity like everybody else is getting. If we can give developers property for a dollar, mm -hmm. why can't we build the people up in our community up and give them the same thing? Mm -hmm. So when we start doing, making sure people get equity and opportunity, you can hold them accountable. Because I ain't about nobody going around me shooting. I don't believe in that. I don't believe in that. I think people need to be held accountable. But you're not going to get me fighting against somebody we didn't try to help. Mm -hmm. I have a lot more questions, but um, I'm going to transition it because I, I want to make sure we do leave time for questions from you. Um, and so uh, I would ask, uh, staff is going to collect questions from audience okay. members. Uh, so okay. Andre Strickland, could you raise your hand so folks see? Um, and he will come around and, and, and collect questions from you. Uh, right now, Just I'm going to transition. Your hand in the air. Yeah, so you, you put them in the air, we will get them. Uh, right now, we're going to transition to um, a conversation about uh, preventing crime and, and addressing reentry. Uh, and that's going to be led by Council Chairman Calvin Hawkins. In my closing, I would have said, as one author observed, tell me and I forget, teach me and I remember, involve me and I learn. We need to teach and involve our young. We owe these kids a childhood and not a route to the American hanging tree that we call the dismal crypt, our prison. I'm grateful Council Member Jawando, Council Member White, that we are having this regional discussion. But what's important to understand for all of you in the audience, this is important to us. I have our senior member, Council Member at Large, Mel Franklin, Council Member Denny <coughs> Tavares, and that young firebrand taking the council by storm Council member Ed Burroughs. Now we were, they were very clear to me about what the structure is tonight. For Con Council member <clears throat> White, Council member Jawando, I will stay within my time, but if you three would just come and say something about this crime piece. I have some time, but I want you all to say something about this crime piece. The council members will forgive me, but the staff gonna say, he went off script. <laughs> <laughs> you gonna have to speak into his mic. <laughs> Hi everyone, I just wanna say again, thank you. Thank you to my chair and everyone here on the panel. Um, at least I represent District 2. Uh, it's very apropos for me to be here because I am I am located right at the Danny, corner. Just, yeah, just, no, there you go. There you oh, go. Okay. I'm right at the corner from uh, across the street from Montgomery County's Tacoma Park and uh, north of Michigan Park. Uh, so I'm right there in the corner. So I feel it all from all directions. And so that's one of the things that, at least right now, I understand the judge saying we have to hold children accountable, but I had to deal with a case where a 14-year-old allegedly was in location to kill a, par, um, a taxi driver, and I had to make sure that this 14-year-old did not spend time in adult prison so we could address his mental health needs. Now he's in juvenile, I've heard from him, he's about to come out, and I'm hoping to put him in private school somewhere in Pennsylvania or, or in Virginia. So the thing is, we've got to care enough to put 
extra attention to address mental health needs. So with that, I just want to say thank you. And we just got to care enough to go the extra mile on some of these children that are doing these things. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. It is a, an honor to be here with my fellow at-large member and fellow council members in this esteemed panel and my colleagues as well. Uh, I just want to briefly say I, I have been uh, edified and educated by the comments already made by this panel. Uh, I, I do want to say that I think we have to focus very intently on the issues of equity, very intently on the issues of economics, very intently on the issues of generational wealth. Um, we are not going to <coughs> substantially change this issue if we do not address the, the disparities in access of opportunity, particularly economic opportunity in our community. If we cannot address the issues and the gaps in generational wealth between black and brown communities and their white counterparts, we're not going to be able to measurably address this issue. Uh, so I look forward to working in tandem and on a regional basis to deal with the central economic <coughs> questions of access to opportunity, access to wealth. If we are still spending in low single digits with black owned business by our governments in this region, we are not going to measurably address the issues of, of disparate economics and lack of access uh, uh, that, that are ingrained in this issue. So I look forward to doing that and working with you and God bless everybody for being here tonight. Uh, thank you. Uh, th thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Brother Franklin. We're all, Brother Franklin, Brother Juando, and I are all alphas, and uh, Councilmember Tavares. Uh, <laughs> it's called Alpha Kappa Alpha, you know, that's what you want to do. Um, you know, what really stood out to me is the comments from uh, Mr. Moten, and I ran the juvenile diversion program in the state's attorney's office for a few years, and you're absolutely correct. Our young people in crisis want to feel loved. They want to feel supported. Um, I sat in juvenile court a lot, and basketball coaches and football coaches had more control over and influence over the young people than their own parents. And so to the extent that we can bolster our youth programming and keep our young people who are struggling in the presence of loving, caring adults, I think that would go a long way. Um, but I absolutely saw what you said because on paper you would look at these young people and say, oh, you did what? You know, this is crazy. And then you talk to them and they just want to be loved and they want support and they want to be able to eat when they go home and they want a warm place to lay down. And so um, I look forward to working with this esteemed group as we're in our budget to create more opportunities for our young people. And I look forward to learning from this esteemed panel and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you all. For the few minutes I have left, we have former Mayor Eugene Grant with us. Mr. Mayor. What? Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. And, and again, I want to thank each of the panelists. Each of you have contributed significantly. Oh. God. <laughs> so this was part of my point. Uh, yeah, this is embarrassing. <laughs> but uh, I, I thank each of the panelists, each of you, uh, the council members, thank you uh, for this extraordinary discussion. Hopefully this will be uh, the first of many more to come, Councilman Joanna, many more to come. Absolutely. Uh, because it's important that we have uh, this type of a dialogue. But we also want to make certain that people at the grassroots level are even more engaged in this dialogue as well. Like Brother Moten is saying, who has worked tremendously in the District of Columbia himself at the grassroots level, these are individuals who are every single day who are working with these challenges. These drive-by mentoring programs are not going to work. These programs that individuals who are coming from other communities into a different community saying that they're going to be the savior of that community is not going to work. The people from the community where they live, whether it's Washington, D.C., whether it's Prince George's County, or whether it's in Montgomery County, the people in those areas, those leaders who understand the trials, the tribulations that they are faced with every single day, must step up to the plate and be the leaders to solve the problems in our community. Thank you. I have some very good re prepared remarks. And thank you, Kendall, for those remarks. But what I'm going to do, because I gave my time up and I want to stay within what we agreed to, 
I'm going to start asking questions. Brother Moten, many of the people spoke and applauded you on what you said, but can you tell the audience how is it, or how is it going? You get a lot of money from D.C. to deal with violence, intervention, try to turn these people around. How do you measure what you're doing and the money you've received mm. from the District of Columbia government? Oh, <clears throat> I would love to show you a report that I had with Pizza Halls before the politics got involved. Mm -hmm. um, I, can, I do a training where I train people how to do the work. And I tell people, how can you, you, you show the work? Take one situation, one successful, mm -hmm. successful situation. How many phone calls did you make? Right. How many times did you have to pick the young person up? How many times did you have to put food in the family's refrigerator? How many times did you have to go to the school? How many times did that young person call you 3 o'clock in the morning? How many times did you go and, and, and show him love when he was playing a football game or a basketball game? How many times did you take him to the movies? How many times did you do conflict resolution? And then, how many times did you go to church or to the mosque with him? So this is all part of successful work. And when you say, what, what is success? That is success. But most people do not value that work, right? And to me, you're really successful when young people start coming to you before something happens. Mm -hmm. That's how I judge my success. Mm -hmm. When we had Peace of Harlem, when we started seeing violence go down, it was not the, the 40 truces that we mediated with brothers like Eric Weaver, who was with us then. Mm -hmm. It was how many times young people started coming to us before something happened. We had young people who would text us when they was on the way to do something bad. They didn't want to be in the car. <laughs> with the people, that, but they had to be in the car because they were from the hood. They would text us on the way to doing something wrong so we can stop it. So I'm just saying, those are the things you gauge what success looks like because success is prevention. It's not responding to the crime. Thank right. you. <laughs> professor, 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 we're here talking of how we effectively address violent crime in our region. You're an erudite, you do a lot of research, but what are the three areas or what three recommendations would you present to Council Member White, Council Member Jawando, and Calvin Hawkins? Maslow's hierarchy of needs, mm. which he just talked about. So at the very base of Maslow's hierarchy of needs is clothing, food, shelter, and a safe place. And if you can deal with those <laughs> basics, you then can actually start thinking about the training programs, the educational opportunities. Um, you can address mental health and, well, and, and overall health and wellness. Um, but if you don't take care of these basic needs, exactly what he's talking about, putting food yeah. into someone's fridge, that actually can give someone the foundation to then be able to work on those better things and feed, with a full tummy, go to school show up on time for job training, learn a new app or whatever the new <laughs> fun things people are doing, young people are doing on their phones. I don't even know what the right words are anymore, so I just get all <laughs> tongue-tied and just, like, whatever the kids are doing. Um, but the idea is they're comfortable texting him because he has shown them, I will take care of your basic needs, which mm. means that they can then be able to trust and work on other things. Thank you. Judge, judge, judge. Yes. You talked about what we need to do. For you, how do we tell the audience, what would you say to the audience about the violence going on? We are talking about things we can do for returning citizens, how we work with our young people. But what's, what do we say as elected officials to those citizens who are saying violence is everywhere? Like in Prince George's County, in 2022, we're in March, I mean April, and we are already 42%, we are 42% higher in Prince George's County in carjacking. It's a regional, national thing, but what do you tell people who are saying, we are too soft on crime? What do we say? <clears throat> well, I, 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 again, uh, the word I use early on is balance, and I'll stick to that. I certainly agree we have to address the underlying causes that's out here. You've heard it from all the panel members as to what's caused it. I also uh, heard uh, something which I certainly agree with, and that is the, the mental challenges 
that we're not really uh, doing enough screening and analysis of the stress and the disorders of a lot of our young people. So we've got to certainly address that. But, uh, but again, uh, I like what I heard uh, from the panel members. We've got to come up with more programs uh, uh, for young people. And as I said before, and I'm gonna stick to that, we have to instill in young people, find a way to instill in young people responsibility and, and uh, respect for each other and respect for others and all of those kind of <coughs> things. You gotta find a platform and a way to reach them because right now we're, we're not getting to them. But again, uh, uh, for those who uh, uh, are uh, out here with the crimes, we gotta deal with that and the balance has to come through uh, uh, necessary sanctions. We've got to put sanctions in place. I'm not going to uh, 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 deviate from that. We have to have sanctions on people who are cancerous uh, to our society. Thank you, thank you. Sister, <laughs> Sister yeah. Pruitt, you want to say something? Yeah, I want to say something about the sanctions. See, the problem why this stuff ain't work, once again, we brought people from outside of our community to do the reform. So they come in to do studies. They just did a study on D.C. telling us something we already know. <laughs> There's a small group of people that caused the problem. We already, you could have paid me to do that study. <laughs> I got the date on that. <laughs> but what we, what, we done, what we took out of the picture was people like us to be a part of that. Mm -hmm. Because i never forget, this was one guy, Marcel Murray. And this is when they started the reform in D.C. at Oak Hill. I was with getting all the youngins out. But I knew it was a few if they went out there, what was going to happen? Because of the situations they were dealing with. If a young person tell you, I, everywhere I go, I got to carry my gun, Mo, I'm going to keep it real with you. It's Mo's job to go try to deal with the situation that make him have to carry the gun. Mm -hmm. But you throw a person out there in the community and where you know all this stuff is going on without fixing it, he came home, what, eight months later, he got killed, thrown on the suit on Parkway, and they, charged, they say he had five, five murders, right? But this could have been prevented if you had the community people involved and help them get them back home in a way where this didn't happen. So all these decisions are made without the stakeholders in the community. That's what the problem is. You know, it's not about the reform, it's about how the reform is done. Right, right. Mm. Uh, Sister Pruitt, as a former police officer, we have these discussions and it always go to police officers are the problem. We got to defund them, we got to do this. We just saw protests outside about something that escalated and caused and ended in a killing. Uh, what do you say to police officers who are doing the right thing each and every day, but they're frustrated because the bad apples have made their professional integrity questionable? What do you say? You, you made some interesting comments. What do you say to those officers still wearing the badge, still out there on active duty, when they hear you talk, what do you say to them? I mean, how do you balance it? Keep it real. Um, first of all, I, you know, I said this yesterday um, to someone that <laughs> cops don't know what a bad cop is. Everybody thinks they're a good cop. Mm. Until a law enforcement, public safety, policing, whatever, whatever phrase you want to give it, can recognize what unethical conduct looks like, what misconduct looks like, what murder looks like, until they can recognize what a, and, and identify and acknowledge what a bad cop is, then everybody's a good cop. So we might as well throw that conversation out the window until we get there. How do we get there? When you're in the police academy, you are taught how to be an effective police officer. But the part that was missing for me and is still missing is the humanity piece. How do you teach police officers if they are willing, because you know training only goes so far as what you're willing to absorb, but how do we teach officers what it is to be a humane officer, to mm. look at people and see a person? The young man who was killed in Grand Rapids, the, you know, police officers are already, their, their opinion is, you know, that was a justified shooting, he had his taser, but where was the humanity when the officer approached his car and said, you got bad tags? Mm -hmm. Bad tags should not equate to losing your life. And so how do we 
get our officers to understand that what they're, who they're serving are people, not just things, not to be objectified. Um, you, you, you learn in the academy and then it is reinforced in your field training and as you become a, a, a police officer that it's better to be judged by 12 than carried by six. That is not a humane outlook. And so I, if I'm talking to police officers, as I do quite a bit, and black officers as well, you, we got to re-examine what we are doing. We know why policing was created as, you know, for slave patrols and this is structure. We are still living under that structure. We, police are not, I come from a police family, by the way. My father was a police officer in Washington, D.C. Police should not, at this stage of the game, be there to oversee. But again, to be part of the community, and the only way that you can do that is to believe that you're part of that community and that you get to humanize the people that you serve. Thank you. And lastly, lastly, Eric, Eric just like uh, Council Member Robert White, here I am, big boy, think I'm big cheese because I'm a council chair, <laughs> uh, Mayor Denny and Ed and Mayor Grant. Like I got it, I can c pick up the phone and call any agency director and get something done. But when my cousin Herbert came home after 33 years, I couldn't get him <laughs> any services. I had to call you. You got him his birth certificate, uh, uh, help him get a non-driver's ID, his social security card. You all, you do that regularly every day. If, if my colleagues who are here, it's four of us, we only need two more to get it done. <laughs> what, what would, if we came to see, on the that's it, that's it. <laughs> if we come to see you, what would you tell us about what we need to do in Prince George's County to help those out there on both sides of the track? And lastly, is the violent intervention <coughs> program in DC working in your opinion? All right, um, I'm gonna go backwards. Um, so in my opinion, I think the, the balance interruption program, it, it's, it's working, it, it could be more done, but I think it is working. Uh, we, Mo talked about um, Peaceaholics and me being a part of Peaceaholics. We saw what happened uh, when Peaceaholics through politics stopped not getting funded. Uh, I was teaching a GED class then and I was counting recently, every person that was in my class um, during that time either went to college or was trying to go to college. When we stopped getting funded, every last one of those guys are dead now. I think one is still left and, and he in jail. So that hap that's what happens when, when, when you stop funding. So I think um, for, from a funder standpoint, having the money in the community, it does give us people that's doing this work uh, more incentive to touch these people, but it also gives <coughs> um, people who normally won't get a job an opportunity to do some meaningful work and get, and get paid for it in, in the community. Um, as far as <coughs> for you all doing stuff, I think, you know, you came to the Ready Center and you saw um, how, how that was working. You were able to see that. I think the blueprint or the wheel has been invented for something like that, I think when we just think about our people coming home and all the anxiety that they have to go through, if we can centralize all their needs in one central location, it would, do, it would make things a whole lot easier for them. So if they can go to one place, and in that one place, in that little bit of time, they can get their birth certificate, they can get their ID, they can get connected to mental health, they can get workforce development training. It takes a lot of um, pressure off of and from their family, because if you're a family member, you got stuff to do too and you're trying to help your family, but you take them to, and I hope nobody here don't work for the DMV or the NBA, <laughs> but you take them to the DMV. That's everybody's worst nightmare to go there and be there for, for 10 hours. And then if you're a family member, you're taking your family member there, and then you come out and they say, okay, I got that, now I need to go somewhere else. And you like, you done took your whole day doing that. So if you can do all that in one place, one if you stop. get got one, the one-stop shop for return, says, where this place is just for them. Even though we would love to be a part of that place where we can go one place, but this is just for return citizens. A one spot where they can go get all their service. Mm -hmm. It makes it a whole lot easier for them and it gets them 
quicker on their road to um, success. Last question, and I'm going to let you speak, Professor, but do you think what you have done in D.C. and with Moat and all of them, that Eddie Mathis and Eon Williams are the right ones to help us get on track in Prince George's County? For sure, and Sean Brains too, I want to say yeah, yeah. <laughs> But for sure, I mean, all of those are definitely <coughs> good, good, good men of mine, me, Eon, and Sean have done over the last 30 years together. Ed is like a, a, a big uncle, big brother, big father to me. I've known Ed since I was probably 13 years old. And uh, I talked to all of them uh, about this type of work. I mean, they understand that, you know, I was out here and people like Mo, we were doing it a little bit before they came out. So they understand that, hey, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel. Hey, this is what we're doing, what you think about this. And, you know, I think they, all three of them, one, they understand it, they've been through it. They, um, they have a following of people that would listen to them as well. So I think they're credible in the community and that's one of the most important things. Professor, and then I'm gonna turn it over to my guy, William Jawan. Two, two immediate policy ideas to what Eric is talking about. One, a one-stop shop. They are so effective. They've been proven effective. One-stop shops literally are what Eric is talking about. It's centralized, but with a twist. I used to, I used to, um, the bus did not go into an area that my parents would allow me to take the bus to the library. But the mobile library used to come around to the community when I was a kid. You could do the same thing with a one-stop shop. Ooh. Is go into the communities versus waiting for people to come to you because it costs money even on public transportation to go places and when people come home they don't have hard <coughs> cash often they don't have enough hard cash they're literally calculating can i do a round trip on metro can i do a round trip on bus do i have enough to eat okay that's the one policy area what i would really like local elected officials to do to push this up to the state level is this Department of Corrections in Maryland is a state-funded organization. The DMV is a state-funded organization. Why can't the DOC, with all the personal information of an individual, create an ID, not a driver's license, just a state ID, to give to a person leaving prison that does not have Department of Corrections stamped on it? That would be the easiest thing because there are two government organizations it is not violating the individual but an individual needs an id to get all these other things that eric is talking about why can't this department of corrections do that when someone is leaving yeah. it would be such an easy fix thank you brother hawkins thank you so much um that was that was really good and we're actually on schedule exactly we're going to switch to audience questions um uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, and as we do that, and I want to, whoever from our staff, just give me one second, the, uh, who's doing a great job, by the way. Amazing discussion. Uh, I'm struck by some themes. Youth programming, right? Uh, we've all talked about that. We just were talking about the other side. When something, when someone is incarcerated or gets into the system, how are we preparing them? That's the reentry discussion. And what, how do we, <coughs> set them up for success, right? Again, none of these are new conversations, but the bi and then the biggest theme I'm hearing is sustained effort. You can't dip your t in local community connection. Ron, Sonia, everyone has said that. You can't just dip in. And I think too often our responses are quick, you know, trying to put a bottle cap on it, simmer it down, and then go back to business as usual. And, you know, I'll give you a perfect example. You know, uh, we have 211 schools in Montgomery County. Uh, I'm on the education committee. I've come on. I went to one of the lowest performing and highest poverty schools right near Denny's District, Oakview Elementary, right in, in Langley Park, Long Branch area. And we didn't have after school programs 30 years ago. There are a couple in that school now. But I, every, every time the they come before me in the committee, I say, why do we not have a plan to have, and, and we can mean set it move, I know we can't do it overnight, to get every school, and we know from research, Dr. Middlemass, four to seven, three to seven, critical hours to keep kids on track. I lost a friend 
to gun violence when he was 17. When he left school, he decided where he was going to go. He didn't have anywhere to go. And he got caught up. It's a story we could all tell about somebody. And he ended up losing his life, getting involved in drugs. I had a place to go. Went to my mom's job. That was my after school program. And the, the, the people, they let me run around and annoy everybody. Right? So how do we, it's, it, we know the solutions. It's sustained effort. And then one of the reasons I'm excited about working with the council members is how do we do this regionally? Like, how do we keep track of the people who are in need, realizing they're coming across all the time for different things? And I think that, you know, whether it's data issues with that, uh, you know, privacy, funding, uh, braiding our HHS departments, all that stuff, you know, that's one of the reasons I'm excited about to work with them, because we got to keep track of people and keep it consistent and sustained effort. So uh, let's turn to our, um, our audience questions. And if you have it directed to an individual, please say that. Or otherwise, whoever wants to speak, please speak up. And now we are in the panel now. <laughs> <laughs> but we're going to defer to y'all mostly. Yeah. Just thank you all for your perspective. I think I speak for the audience where there's so many unique perspectives. It feels like a, a puzzle. And each perspective is it, to put the puzzle together to get to a solution. I say that to foreshadow our first question. I think the most consistent concern the audience has is this mental health puzzle piece and component. And so that's, we picked one question that we think encompasses the majority of the mental health questions we received. So while we want to hold youth accountable for inappropriate or illicit activities, how do we address their mental health challenges and their need for a <coughs> substantive and reliable support system that keeps them from recidivism? for everyone on the panel. Anyone in particular? <laughs> so where to start? Because I, I can start it off. Uh, I, I think we all have to recognize that there's a lot of stress out here, a lot of anxiety, and there's a lot of mental challenges that young people have. And that's because of the nature of the world and, and all of the uh, problems out here. And so I think the first thing is to recognize that there are problems and we've got to screen our young people uh, and, and treat them for a lot of the anxiety and the things that they're facing. And that's part of the problem. So the, the mental challenges is something that the policy makers here have to recognize and address. We address it at school, we address it at home and in the other areas of the community. But mental challenges is real. And uh, it's contributing to a lot of the violence out here. Trauma-informed care, um, when we think about dealing with mental health, wellness, and illnesses. Um, Trauma-informed care can help those because oftentimes mental illnesses are, are or, or sorry, let me rephrase, acting out is triggered by some form of trauma, but we call it mental illness, when in reality their trauma has not actually been addressed in a holistic way. Right. Um, also, we have to realize <laughs> that, yes, mental health, is now more prominent, we talk about it, but the criminal justice system seems to be the only government institution that consistently addresses mental health issues. <laughs> like, we, we, we close, we, elected officials, not the ones here, elected officials in the late 1970s and 1980s closed mental health institutions. So where are we now putting our mentally <laughs> ill individuals? We're now jailing them and incarcerating them, which makes then the incarceration experience more traumatizing, where people literally will have ment ment be mentally well and be incarcerated, but come out because of the experience. It's called prison PTSD for a small percentage <laughs> of people that come home. But we're not actually addressing it because we now have privatized you know, healthcare and the states that have not implemented um, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, don't actually have those services available for people coming home. So I think this collectively, it's, it's the kids all the way through to those that are then in the community and coming home from prison. I want, uh, I, when, I, when I think about it, I think one, um, we definitely have to just look at the whole family and not just pick an individual <coughs> out the house to right. uh, address an issue with. It's almost like a house, everybody has a cold in the house and we take one person out and we get them some mess and then we put them back in the house and you know, they gonna get the cold again because everybody else in the, in the house has the cold. Um, one of the things that I do, 
I see though because they are a lot of I know in DC anyway we get a new mental health um, agency or company that pops up every week we probably got a hundred of them but I'm not sure about the where the accountability is and seeing what type of service they actually providing I've seen a lot of them where and me and Mo work for one where they were more concerned about the numbers than the, than the service they were providing so all they was concerned was where how many people did we link today because that's how they get their money not by the service they provide by the amount of people that they see and, and so I think we really got whole mental health agencies accountable too you know and it's not it can't be a cookie cutter approach you can't treat me and somebody else the same because we got different issues so I think you know er, you know when we talk about accountability it, it got to be accountability on that part as well and, and I would say this too um, policy once again so some of the most effective <laughs> mental health organizations had people who, who went to school and college but they weren't licensed because when you come home from college you're trying to get a job you don't have a year or two to work under somebody and not get paid right so a lot of effective organizations went out of business because they could no longer build because of that situation the other thing i would say is that hurt people hurt people and our young people are being numbed in elementary school now i use one elementary school stanton in ward eight they had like maybe seven of their peers kill, killed over a two-year period in the elementary school so they are numb and I guarantee you, because I talked to some of the parents and some of the coaches in the school, because the coaches are like the parents too, like they said earlier, none of these children get therapy. None of them get therapy. So if you start being numb to violence and it's normalized, it's easy for you to inflict pain on other people mm -hmm. because that becomes your norm, mm -hmm. right? And I remember this one guy, I won't say his name, he was locked up for murder. He saw a guy whoop his mother with a hammer. He was the nicest person in the world to children. But if one man disrespected him, he had no problem with killing him. Now, is that really his fault? Or is it the fact that he never got any services? He saw somebody beat his mother with a hammer in an abusive relationship over and over again. He never got any services. So we got to think about like, how important it is to get to these young people early. And let's be clear, there's a big difference between somebody at Baloo who loses a friend every month to violence and somebody, let's say even Montgomery County, who friend that uh, died because they was drunk driving at a prom. Right, right. That school is going to get therapy all week as long as they need them. In Baloo, that's not going to happen because it's been normalized and it's accepted as they supposed to get through it. Mm -hmm. So we got to, like, when you start talking about dealing with trauma, let's be real. In these pockets where all the violence is, whether it's PG County, Montgomery County, or DC, if we're not dealing with that, it's gonna keep on reproducing itself. If I could jump in on this conversation about mental health and police officers. Yeah. Okay, so what did you say hurt people hurt people? Yeah. Not every person, I would say not most people sign up to be the police to hurt people. Right? They're human beings who are drawn to the, to the job for many different reasons. There's something called vicarious traumatization. That's where uh, you are exposed to these traumas and you absorb them and you're not handling the trauma yourself. You, you just, that's what police officers do. We see people who have, you know, in their worst, at their worst, we see dead people. We see dead children. We see body parts. We see people fighting. A high rate of suicide, and I'm saying we because, you know, in my heart, that's what I still do. A high rate of suicide, high rate of domestic violence, high rate of substance abuse. That's not because of nothing. That is because of the exposure and experiences of police officers. So if you want them to be healthy and well and, and, and thriving members of your community, our community, then we have to make sure that we are paying attention to their mental health needs as well. Uh, Councilman uh, Hawkins, I, I need to uh, mention that uh, you just successfully completed a reentry advisory group, <laughs> and uh, you were you responsible for that legislation. And uh, as you recall, one of the recommendations and one of the points raised was that there's a too few 
people in the county jail are available to screen and treat a lot of the inmates. And uh, a good significant amount of them are on psychotropic drugs in the county uh, detention center. And uh, when they are released, it's not, they're not treated. And they come out, they don't have insurance, and it's a number of things. So that mental uh, uh, piece that the, the audience has just uh, brought up is very, very critical here. That we've got to address this, not just to inmates, but as uh, uh, we say, younger, younger young people. Yeah in the uh, elementary schools and the middle schools. They've got to be addressed. Thank, Thank you. Our next question, again, for all the panelists, uh, please give your position on school resource officers in the public school system. I saw you look at me when you <laughs> said that. Miss <laughs> <laughs> Prude, if you want to take we're it. All, we're all looking at you, Captain. <laughs> I, I'll chime in, too, so you go first. So um, I had the privilege to uh, supervise school resource officers three times in my career. As a sergeant, um, <coughs> as an administrative lieutenant for the assistant chief of the Patrol Service Bureau, and then as the um, director of the <coughs> community engagement division. And I will say to you that um, I have mixed feelings about school resource officers. Uh, most of our school resource officers got the assignment. You had to apply for the position, which means you had some skin in the game and you, you, know, you were committed if you were applying for this position. You weren't just given the position and just, we just need to put you in this position and keep you quiet or to go somewhere until you retire. They apply because they're committed, right? Um, there was a great emphasis put on their relationship with the school community, the student, the parent, the principal, you know, everybody, the faculty in the schools. Um, I think that Montgomery County's model was a great one. Um, I think that school resource officers, the, the, the thought of having a school resource officer overall is something, again, that is a jurisdictional conversation. What are, this, what are those needs? What do, the, what do the parents think? And if the parents are not invested in school resource officers, then you shouldn't have them. It's as simple as that to me. But if you're going to have the program, it has to have a lot of checks and balances and a lot of supervision and oversight. Because not every school resource officer is going to get the assignment. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, <coughs> I, yes, wrote a, I wrote a book um, that I just put out recently. Mm -hmm. And one of the op-eds, one of 15 op-eds that I published in the Washington Post since 2006 talks about the pipeline of black officers to the Metropolitan Police Department. I think the biggest problem is cultural competence, mm -hmm. right? That's number one. Number two, let's be real. A lot of people say they don't want the police in the schools. The, the Earth Weavers, the Ronald Mo it's not our job to be the police, right? People bring guns to school every day. They bring knives to school every day. I don't want the police in the schools, but everywhere my child is, I want a police at the door. <laughs> Not just because of people in my community. We got nuts trying to come in our schools that ain't even from D.C. So you don't know when that day is going to come. So I'm just saying for safety, they need to be trained right and it needs to be institutionalized right. It shouldn't feel like a prison. Officer Buck at Baloo, all the children loved Officer Buck. And they would tell you, if Officer Buck locked you up, you deserved it. Because he would do everything to fight for you and keep you not going to prison, even against the police department. So what I'm saying is, it's a certain type of officer to be a school resource officer. That's not for everybody. But there are good officers. Every officer is not a bad person. So I just, I just like, when I know this coming outside the school, you see youngers hiding guns outside the school, not because they bad most of the time, they fear for their lives. Mm. So until we deal with the fear right. that our youngers have yeah. and what they're going through, we got to make sure they're safe. Yeah. I, I'll just add, because I've been involved in this issue a lot, and I know many of our school resource officers that Captain Pruitt talked about who are good people who care about kids, this is a systems issue versus a personal issue. And the system of policing, and, and uh, Sonia talked about this at the beginning, the history of it, how it's developed, who it operates to serve, 
it disadvantages certain communities, kids of color, black children in particular, disabled students, and even if it's a paper arrest, right? Say the officer is the nicest person in the world. And you, you, because of the proximity, you create a pipeline into the criminal justice system. That is a negative outcome. Doesn't mean the officer was a bad person. It means they were directed to create an arrest. And, and so you have to look at it situationally. Absolutely. Can a, trusted, a, can a police officer be a trusted, caring adult? that helps mentor children, absolutely. You know, and I, and I know many of them. We have one right here uh, who did it for me 20 years ago when I was an AmeriCorps member with the Montgomery County Police Department. I, I'm sorry, I failed, right? <laughs> 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 but the question is, when you have a school that's 2,000 students <coughs> and you don't have a school psychologist, but you have a police officer, mm. that's a, that now we're out of, we're in a system of policy discussion of, what do we what do we value? What are we spending our money on? And so uh, you get in this false dichotomy of a choice. And then you have, you know, black students, 19 percent of the population, 50 percent of the arrests. And then you dig in. What are they being arrested for fighting mm -hmm. things that I did? Um, and so we have to we have to look at the system. And it has nothing to do, in my opinion, with an officer's intentions. There are some bad officers that are going to do bad things. It's what's the system? If we're not providing these other supports and we put a Band-Aid on a gaping wound, you're going to get inequity. And, and that's the problem with spending $20 million, in our case, in Montgomery County on SROs. We don't have a school psychologist in every building. So. Our, our last audience question is from a member Dude, of the two more. Oh, two more? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Look, you're the boss. You need two more. Yeah. <laughs> um, so our second to last question is from... <laughs> Um, the founder of the National Coalition for Drug Legalization, I say that because it's relevant to the question. There is a correlate, and, and sorry, this is for our three council members, specifically. <laughs> <laughs> there, is let Calvin ask. <laughs> there is a correlation between the increase in violent crime and drug prohibition. What work are you doing to conduct research on the issue? And can I work with your office to do the research or can similarly situated organizations, can I work with you to do that research? I'm not doing anything, but I'm open to the person that asked that question to work with my staff and I to uh, see where we go. I'm open, but I'm not doing anything right now. Uh, I, I would say that I'm, I'm, I'm certainly open to work, working with the person. I, I, I don't know the data that it premises the question, uh, so, so, so I can't speak ultimately to, to the accuracy of it, uh, but I do want to learn more. I also believe that it, it is time that we start to have public conversations uh, on drug decriminalization uh, because I think that many people have a feeling about it, but I think the feeling is a reactive feeling uh, that has more to do with the history of how we have dealt with uh, drugs and, and narcotics uh, and not enough about sort of what the actual outcome and impact is uh, and whether we're sort of helping or hurting the cause uh, with, with these, these sentences. And so you know, what, what people have to understand often is that we, we can legislate on issues, but, but the issues generally have to be developed and primed through the public first because we are public representatives. And so it's not generally appropriate for us to kind of parachute in and say, I know you all haven't thought about this, but we know what's best. Um, and so you know, I'm hearing more of this conversation bubble up. I, I think too much of the conversation right now is directed at sort of elected officials and not enough uh, focus on the communities to start to have that conversation. And I, and I say that looking at the uh, decriminalization and legalization of marijuana. Uh, the, what happened in a period of 10 years was, was pretty significant, uh, but it had to do more with, with public conversation than sort of specific legislation. Can I just add one thing Please. to that? Also, uh, we talk about that question you asked, we talk about that often. But then we just had a conversation about mental health. If we don't correlate drug usage with mental health issues, we're not, we're just kicking the can alone. Uh, and that's what I think we're doing with a lot of these issues. We're not courageous enough, not the public officials, the community, uh, I'm talking about the community alone with the public officials. If we say we have mental health issues and, and professor, if the research shows 
the connection between mental health and drug usage, we only talk about criminalization, then we are not dealing with the issue. And I'm glad to work with these two gentlemen to really address a multiple of issues, and that's one of them. And that's why I'm open to working with the person. I agree with that. I'm open to it as well. Oh, man. So we can get to the last question. Yeah. I apologize, Chair Hawkins, this is for you. Um, <laughs> that's, that, that, that's why Will said two more. <laughs> he wrote the question. Um, There's a ringer in the audience. <laughs> so, um, and, but I'm sure this person would, would welcome any other thoughts. Um, there have been over 130 carjackings in Prince George's County in the first three months of this year. This is a faster pace um, increase than nearly 400 carjackings that we've seen that we had last year, which is almost three times as high as three years ago. Um, this is a state of emergency. A majority of those arrested for these crimes have been youth, as has been discussed in the panel. What do, what do you believe, Chair and, and panelists, um, is causing so many youth carjackings and so many youth to commit this type of offense today? I could give you a million dollar answer, but I don't have an answer to that question. I don't. Colleagues, I don't. You know, I, we see the data in my notes. I have the information about carjacking. They increased up to 42% already this year. Right now, our county executive and police chief are <coughs> having a crime meeting over in Soupman, the Soupman community of Prince George's County dealing with that very issue. I'm sure that was a major topic because that Suitland area is one of the areas where we have a high car jacking uh, situation. But I don't have the answer, and I don't give answers if I don't have the information to respond. And whoever asked the question, I apologize, but I don't have the answer. I, I'll take a stab at that. I wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post uh, and talk about it in the book about um, we, we used to take young people to New York to protest against the makers of Grand Theft Auto, which is a game to this day that's promoted to our children, where they commit heinous crimes, they carjack, they rob people, they use drugs. And I even had walked in with my daughter playing the game, and she know I'm against it. So I'm just saying, <laughs> that's how addictive this stuff is and how cool it is. But it's scientifically proven anything you do 30 days in a row will change the way you think. It don't mean you're going to carjack somebody but you might get in a car and they're stolen, right? Then you gotta look at what, what the dynamics that have changed. You used to be able to go and steal a car without carjacking somebody. You can't steal these cars now. So what the youngest do, they gotta use a gun to get your car. They didn't used to have to use a gun years ago. So it don't mean that they really that bad, it just means that they can't go and just steal your car because of the technology in the cars now. So that's one of the reasons why more young people Still, I mean, carjack. But we have to also understand most of them, when they carjack, they either rob somebody with them, with the car, or they sell the car. We're talking about economics, once right. again. Yeah. We're talking about equity, once again. So if we don't deal with the root causes to things, young people, just like we do, just like we saw people in Ukraine do, when they couldn't get food, they start fighting each other, right? These weren't criminals. These were people who were in a situation where they needed to eat. So once again, we're talking about equity, equality, and a lot of other things, but we also got to look at the other factors that influence our young people. I appreciate that. This, we could go on all night with this, um, and this will be the first of many, and I wanna, I'll start and I want to ask my colleagues any closing thoughts. Um, but I really appreciate the conversation you know, we're, one of the reasons I'm glad we're in Silver Spring, and this is a long-term commitment. Yes. Councilmember Hawkins, Councilmember White, and the community. Uh, we're in this together. Uh, one of, in downtown Silver Spring, we're right here on the border. Uh, we had had a spike, we've had a spike, and it's one of many spikes over a long period of time. I've been here my whole life. You have ups and downs. Talk about that bottle cap approach. But we've had a spike in, in crime and in gun crime, right? And some associated with nightlife let out, some during the day, some Instagram beef that spills over into a parking lot, you know, all the, all the reasons that things happen. And we've said it's unacceptable. Um, but, you know, one of the things I know we have to do is talk, we have to have deep community conversation about the solutions. Um, and we had some, uh, we can't have knee-jerk reactions. And I, I give you an example as I close and turn to my colleagues. 
uh, we have nightlife establishments here in downtown Silver Spring that service people from this region. Um, and it's really a new thing, 10, 15 years, uh, that they've really been started to, to come op open. Uh, when we had started to have some issues this latest round, there were calls of, you know, well, it's, the, it's those folks that are doing it. And they're mostly black and brown owned establishments. And it was those folks that are causing the problem. And I asked our police department, I said, well, have you spoken to the owners and the managers of these clubs? Well, they don't want to talk to us, okay? Uh, I called them all up. I convened a meeting right before New Year's Eve to have a very tactical meeting. Hey, how long are you staying open? Tell, tell Chief Jones and Commander McBain, how long are you staying open? When are you letting out? What's happening? We were able to coordinate, got all the, mostly all the club owners to come with the police. First time they had met, yeah. first time. And we've seen some progress, right? So there are things, and I want to say this to the public, that there's no silver, sil I won't go say silver bullets, but, <laughs> but you know, there's no uh, magic solution here. But there are things that we can do. We've added lighting. We've created a, a, a WhatsApp group between the club owners that they're communicating about people who are problem people who are coming down here to create a problem from the let out in, in D.C. or Prince George's County. <laughs> 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 it's a regional thing, or whatever it is. There are, there are things we can do in the short term, but we are going to have to get to these large, and there's no one way to solve it. And I just, I just want my folks to know, and I know these gentlemen agree in the panelists, I'm committed to those short, medium, and long-term solutions. But what I will not do is just act like putting a Band-Aid on something is going to fix it. <coughs> and, and that's what we cannot do. So uh, I appreciate both of you, and uh, I really look forward to this continued conversation. We're going to do it in different parts of the state, different parts of the region, uh, and we're going to make sure that there's substantive follow-up action and regional action to come out of these. So thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to <laughs> thank you. Turn over to Council Member Hall. Will, you really said it for all three of us. Uh, this is important from a regional perspective. Our county exec and some of our colleagues are over, and as I said, they may have finished by now and are in soup and dealing with this issue. We are out here with you and good brother uh, Robert White talking about it from a regional perspective. We have our African Dispara uh, representative from the county exec's office here. We have 100 black men in Prince George's County here. And we have so many different individuals that believe in what we are trying to do as a group. Not just the three of us, but as a group. And I'm looking forward to the opportunity to work with all of you. It means something to have my colleagues come all the way here. Reverend Barbara, Reverend Barbara it means something to see the men in the gap represented here because you all are committed. And, and I just want you to know, I, I see you, I see you. Uh, Eddie, Eon, Brother Sean, and all of you brothers, I'm just glad you're here. And we're gonna get this matter resolved with my colleagues. And like they said, this is not a one-stop shop. And we got our park and planning representative here. This is how important it is for Prince George's County because we believe in you two and what you stand for and this panelist, and this has been a great conversation. <laughs> a great conversation. <laughs> but what came out of this conversation for me is, if we listen to the subject matter experts, and that's what I'm calling you all, uh, and we come up with a timetable for implementation of some of your ideas, we can make our region better, and I believe we can. I got two great leaders and the leaders down there. We'll get it done. So, Brother White. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I just in, encourage, I think this, this was such a healthy discussion. Uh, as, as I said earlier, um, you know, there, there was a lot of pain uh, that we saw flow out yeah. of the black community uh, during the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, one of the incredible things was the number of allies that I saw. And what that tells me is that this is a time where can, we can really take hold of, of this momentum and, and sort of move to the next level. And one of the things we have to be careful about is to not participate in or allow ourselves to fall into uh, the traps of kind of gotchas and mischaracterizations. It is important that we talk about police reform and criminal justice reform 
Um, and, uh, and it is important that folks who see things differently not mischaracterize, because not everybody's saying we need to reform mm -hmm. the police is saying that we need to defund the police. And there aren't many people saying we don't need any police. There aren't many people saying that. But there are a lot of people saying we need to do things differently. And I think, as far as I'm concerned, that is a fact. We must do things differently. We didn't get here by accident. Sort of the amounts of, of, of poverty and, and crime that we see in communities of color didn't happen by historical accident. It happened uh, by historical purpose. Um, mm. And we have to deal with that. Uh, we have to deal with the underlying uh, impact of, of, of slavery, of segregation, of economic and housing and education injustice. Uh, we as elected officials have to be serious about leveling that, that playing field. Uh, but we also have to remember that the young people that we don't tend to become the older people that we incarcerate, and none of us want to see that. So what is important, I think, is that we continue to, to take hold of this time, this moment, where people are, are ready to lean in and, and have this conversation and sort of uh, do, the, do the difficult things, you know, have those difficult conversations. And the last thing that I will say is in looking for solutions, we have to continue to talk to people closest to the problem. Uh, the best solutions that I've developed in D.C. Uh, have come from Eric Weaver, Ron Moten, and folks that work with them. And often all we have to do as leaders is listen. Uh, if we do that, I think we're going to be better off. But uh, I appreciate uh, both of these brothers for uh, in engaging in this and, and really want to give a huge uh, public shout out to our staff who really did an incredible yeah. amount of work. Last thing I'll say, since I'm the host council member, yeah. um, the next event we're going to do together <coughs> has been said, and I know Ron will know this, nothing stops a bullet like a job. And we're going to do uh, some regional job fairs together uh, that are targeted at folks in the community that need opportunity. Uh, so that's going to be part of this next step. I think we're going to, the next thing we're going to do is going to be in Prince George's County. Yeah. Uh, so we will keep this group together, and we'll be talking more about these issues. But we appreciate your commitment. Hope you'll stick with us uh, throughout the process and give us your ideas. You, obviously, I know not every question was answered, uh, but we are very easy to find. Our staffs are here. Uh, you can email us, uh, and this will be an ongoing conversation. So with that, can we give our panel a big round of applause? As well? yeah. Have a good evening, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much. Eric, enjoy your comments, man. Thank you.